We have a special this time. We have Brother Mark and Sister Joni going to sing for us. Hello. All right. I'm getting getting notices from the back. I'm not on. This is a this is an old song. It was written in 1956, and a, a man by the name of Harry Belafonte released it in 1957. Joni and I sang it last Christmas, and I love this old song. I can't tell you any other songs that Harry Belafonte released or sang or anything, but I know this one because I hear it when they play the Christmas songs each year, and we fell in love with this one, and we wanted to learn it last year, and we wanted to sing it again today. Forevermore, 
right, stand with me, if you will, one more time. Page 133, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. We'll do all three verses of page 133. will come at this time. Uh, we will take our morning tithes and offerings. We trust that you will give as God has prospered you. Be faithful to his word and certainly he'll be faithful to you. Come on down, Lee, right here, Lee. And uh, that's your spot. All right. Your spot. All right. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask the Lord to bless this offering and uh, to provide for the needs of this church so that the gospel can go forth. Uh, from this place to all of the world. Amen. Lee, you pray for us, buddy.
the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. Debbie, thank you, Brother Ken, thank you, Mark and Joni, and uh, two good specials this morning. I love that song. Love to hear, love to hear them sing it. Amen. Well, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Philippians, chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, <clears throat> and I'll try not to drop anything else. Jimmy, Jimmy. Jimmy's really, he's like a Barnabas to me. He's such an encouragement to me. And uh, he's leaving the choir. He said, hey, 
won't drop anything else today. And I told Brother Richard, I said, push him down the steps when he, when you go down. There are several things that you can always count on seeing during the Christmas season, aren't there? Houses covered up with Christmas lights, uh, highways covered up with Christmas traffic, malls covered up with Christmas shoppers, fields covered up with Christmas trees, uh, kids covered up with Christmas toys. Um, that list is a mile long. You're, you're, at some point, you're going to see a bumper sticker or a, or a sweatshirt or, or maybe a billboard that's going to, it's going to say, um, put Christ back into Christmas. Uh, I've always kind of been amused by that, by that sign because if you really understand Christmas, then you understand you can't take Christ out of Christmas. Um, the two go hand in hand. If you don't have Christ, you don't have Christmas. It would be like us saying, you know, put bananas back in banana pudding. Well, well if you take bananas out of banana pudding, you, you have pudding. Um, you don't have banana pudding. Or put baseball back into baseball. Well, you take that round ball out of the game, you don't have the game. Truth is, you can't have one without the other. And that's why for a few weeks now we've been in this series uh, that, that we've been calling Unwrapping the Gift of Christmas. Uh, far too many people will unwrap Christmas gifts without ever unwrapping the real gift of Christmas, and of course that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know that the earliest record of any celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ dates to about 300 years after he died? Um, and, and it's because of his birth, and, and really only because of his birth, that Christmas became a holiday uh, tradition, a yearly tradition. And it's, it's amazing that all over the world, uh, billions of people are going to stop everything that they're doing to celebrate the peasant son of a carpenter born in a truck stop town that only had one red light, born to a teenage girl and a young man that wasn't even his biological father. This man that billions of people are going to celebrate and stop everything they're doing to celebrate. He never wrote one word that was recorded. He never spoke to more than a few thousand people at one time, and he never even traveled more than 30 miles away from his home. And yet 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there are millions of people who are studying what he said, reading the words that he spoke, worshiping him as the God of this world, and that is because there is more to the glory of Christmas than just the story of Christmas. Really, when you nail it down, Christmas was just the beginning of a round trip that Jesus took from heaven to earth and back to heaven. If you want to graduate with a degree in Christmas, you've got to take three classes. You've got to take Christmas biology. We took that two weeks ago. We learned that in Christmas biology that, that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he had an earthly mother but a heavenly father. He's the only child that's ever been born without a sinful nature. He was the sinless son of God. The second class we took, the second message, if you want to earn a degree in Christmas, is not only Christmas biology, but Christmas theology. And in that class, we learned that Jesus was a human being just like, just like you, that he was born a baby, uh, just like all babies. And, and yet, at the same time, he was the son of God, unlike any baby that's ever been born. He was fully human and yet fully God. I, I told you last Sunday that Jesus is the only baby that's ever been born, that at the moment of his birth, he was older than his mama in the same age as his father. Christmas theology. And yet that's still not where the Christmas story ends. There's a third class that you've got to take if you want a degree in Christmas. Christmas biology, Christmas theology, and then there's Christmas doxology. The word doxology is an interesting word. It comes from two Greek words. One means praise or glory, and the other means word. And so a doxology is literally a word of praise or an expression of glory. If you're going to understand Christmas doxology, we need to turn to a man <clears throat> who, unlike the shepherds and a little later the wise men, he wasn't at the birth of Jesus. As a matter of fact, um, as, a, as a writer in the New Testament, he he never explicitly talked about the birth of Jesus. 
Unlike the disciples, he never physically met Jesus. Oh, he met him, but not physically. And though he never mentions the biology of Christmas, and he really doesn't dwell on the theology of Christmas, I think he gives us the greatest doxology of Christmas that you'll find in the Bible. He shows us the full meaning of Christmas. He shows us this Christmas gift, the present of Jesus Christ, fully unwrapped. One man said he gives us the rest of the story. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2 if you're, if you're not there yet. <clears throat> and what you're going to see from the pen of the Apostle Paul is something that most people probably miss every single year. And that is, Christmas does begin with a baby in a cradle, but that's just the beginning. The middle story is that that baby in a cradle grew up to be the sinless son of God who went to Calvary's cross and died as the savior of this world. But that's still not the end of the story. The end of the story of Christmas is that it ends with a king wearing a crown. Christmas is more than a season. And Christmas is certainly more than one day on your calendar each year. Christmas really is the reason that you ought to put your focus on Jesus Christ. Christmas is the reason that you ought to place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christmas is the reason you ought to proclaim him as Savior of this world all year around. I'm going to give you three things this morning as we think about Christmas doxology and uh, three things that tomorrow or tonight that you gather with family and eat a good meal and open gifts. And by the way, that's all appropriate and all good, and, and we'll do the same, and I hope you do. But don't put Jesus on the back burner. Keep him at the forefront, and I'm going to give you three things to remember this year for Christmas doxology. Number one, be thoughtful that Jesus identified with us. And we're going to get to the text in just a moment, but you've got to keep in mind that that when you read the writings of the Apostle Paul, that Paul really doesn't give any details about Jesus' birth. He, he leaves that to Matthew, and he leaves it to Dr. Luke. They take us to what happened in Bethlehem. Paul's going to take us back to what happened before Bethlehem. Uh, Paul's going kind of backstage, if you will, behind the curtains of eternity, and he's going to show us what took place before Christ was ever born in Bethlehem's manger. Notice what the Bible says in Philippians chapter number 2, verse number 5. <clears throat> Paul writes, and he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, Paul's there for just a moment. We'll get to the rest of the text in, in, in a second, but Two things jump out to me immediately as I, as I read this. First of all, Jesus was in the form of God, the Bible says. The word form is an interesting word. It, it, it refers to a, to a Roman stamp. In this day, an official government document would be sealed with hot wax and then, and then a ring bearing the emperor's uh, seal uh, would be pressed into that document, into that wax, and it would leave an exact representation of the seal of, of the emperor's ring. And what Paul is telling us is that Jesus is a very precise, exact representation of God. In other words, he is exactly God. The word equal there in the text is the word isos in the Greek. Uh, we get our word isosceles for, for you geometry people. Uh, an isosceles triangle is a triangle with two equal sides. sides and, and the word simply means equal in size, equal in quality, and equal in character. In other words, Jesus is equally God. But Jesus was eternally God. In every way, Jesus uh, Christ was and is God. He did, not, he did not cling to that equality when he came to this earth, but he certainly claimed that equality when he came to this earth. And the point that Paul is trying to make to you and I this morning is that when Jesus became a man, he never ceased from being God. When Christ became a man, there was no subtraction. He was still God in all of his fullness. There was no division. He didn't give up any of his godhood to make room for his manhood. He wasn't part human, part divine. He wasn't a mixture of deity and, and humanity. He was fully both. And so there was no subtraction when Jesus came. There was no division, but there was addition. He took on a human nature that he had never possessed prior. 
In other words, Paul is talking about the greatest miracle that I believe has ever taken place. Uh, the creation of the world, the parting of the Red Sea, Jesus walking on water, you name it. But I think the greatest miracle in all of history is that God became man. Now, don't misunderstand this about Jesus. Jesus is not just a man among men. Um, he's not first among equals. He's not even the greatest of the great. He's God. He's God. If the FBI had fingerprints of Jesus, you'd have the fingerprints of God because he's God. But something else jumps out here. Notice in verse 7, <coughs> it says he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. In other words, when Jesus got on the ladder of humanity, he started at the lowest, the lowest step. And, and though he was a king, he took on the form of a servant, literally a, a slave, a bond servant. He, and it puzzled a lot of people who met him. And, and if you'll read the Gospels, you'll find that it even puzzled his disciples from time to time. They, they were expecting a Messiah to come as a conquering king, as a reigning king king as as an honored king they, they didn't expect that he would even come as a mere man they expected that he would be born into royalty to be surrounded by servants not be a servant himself and yet instead the opposite took place he took on the form of a servant he lived just like a slave because remember slaves owned absolutely nothing and jesus never owned anything as a matter of fact jesus had to borrow everything he borrowed a, a place to be born. He borrowed a place to sleep. He borrowed a boat to cross the Sea of Galilee. He, he borrowed a donkey to ride into the, into the city on. He borrowed a room to have the Lord's Supper at. He even borrowed a tomb to be buried in. And yet we're told that he's born in the likeness of man. The word likeness there is an interesting word. It means to be exactly like what it appears to be. <coughs> now Jesus was not a clone Jesus was not God in disguise. Um, he wasn't a facsimile of a human being. He was real flesh, real blood, man, just like you and I. And yet what is so unique to Christianity is not just the belief that Jesus was God, but, but that in Jesus, God literally became a human being. We call it the incarnation. Every other religion expects that their God to be just that, to be God. That God would never consider becoming a human being, but the lowest of human beings, certainly not, certainly not. And yet there's no other faith in the history of the world besides Christianity that has ever considered God becoming human essential to its faith in God. And I'll tell you, that's a big reason we celebrate Christmas, the fact that God identified with us. He came into this world as a human being, tempted in all points, just like you and I, yet without sin. The Christmas birth begs the Christmas question. If Jesus was God, why did he identify with us as a human being? I mean, think about it. Why in the world would the Son of God leave the glory of heaven and come to the glory of earth as the Son of Man? Why would he leave a throne as a king and come to earth as a slave? Why would he leave a place where he was exalted to come to a place where he would be executed? And that leads us to our second point of Christmas doxology. Number one, when you gather with your family tonight, tomorrow, you're opening gifts, you're eating a good meal, don't put Jesus on the back burner. Remember, be thoughtful that Jesus identified with us. But number two, be thankful that Jesus was crucified for us. Jesus was God who became an infant who went to the lowest. But the lowest went as low as he could possibly go. And notice what the Bible says in verse 8 to prove that. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. <coughs> Boy, what an understatement. Jesus humbled himself. He went from sitting on a throne to laying in a manger, to hanging on a tree. He went from being a king with a crown to a baby with diapers to a criminal on a cross. He humbled himself. 
Why is that? Well, because your soul was more important than his blood. Your eternal life was more important than his earthly life. Your place in heaven was very important to him, so much so that he gave up his place for 33 years so that you could have your place. In other words, the one person who had the right to demand his right gave up his rights for us. I hear that statement often. You, you'll, you do as well, certainly in this, this woke culture that you and I live in that I despise, by the way. Um, I want my rights. I want my rights. Friend, you, don't make the mistake of saying that because if you got what your rights were and if I got what my rights were, I'd be in a devil's, devil's hell for all of eternity. I don't want my rights. I want grace and I want mercy. He humbled himself. He, 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 the only one who ever had a right to demand his rights, the sinless, perfect Son of God, gave up his rights so that you would one day have a right to enter into his heaven for all of eternity. He did not play the God card. He, he humbled himself by obeying God to the point of death. And, and understand this morning that Jesus didn't die out of obligation. The text says out of obedience. He died out of obedience. When his father asked him to leave the glory of, of heaven for the grief that he would get on earth, he said yes. When the father asked for him to die for sins that you committed, that I committed, that he did not commit, he said yes. Don't think that the father had to force the death of Christ upon Christ. He, he didn't coerce the son to die. It was the father's will that he would, but it was the son's decision and his obedience to carry out the Father's will. He never called him to die, and he did not compel him to die. And the Roman soldiers did not overpower him and, and forcibly take him to the cross, as we've seen in, a, in the Gospel of John in recent weeks during our Sunday morning uh, series in John's Gospel. Oh, no, they didn't overpower him. As a matter of fact, Jesus overpowered them and allowed them to take him to the cross. Friend, the problem is you cannot separate the birth of Jesus from the death of Jesus. Without the incarnation, the crucifixion would have been meaningless. Without the incarnation, the resurrection would have never happened. God became a human being not just to live with us, but God became a human being to literally die for us. And friend, it was as a man that Jesus died, but it was as God that he died for us. The cradle without the cross is incomplete. And the cross without the cradle is ineffective. And Paul makes sure that we understand this point, that, that he didn't just die, but he died. And Paul says, even the death of a cross. In other words, he did not die a death, a peaceful death, on a, on a soft bed surrounded by friends and family. No, he died the death of a common, everyday, worst form of criminal death that you could imagine. As a matter of fact, to this day still, crucifixion is still the most excruciatingly painful, uh, cruel, shameful form of execution that's ever been conceived by humanity. And it was such a, a low form of death that it was reserved for the worst of the worst. As a matter of fact, if you were a Roman citizen, then, then you couldn't be crucified. No matter how bad of a crime you committed because you were a Roman and it, you were still too good for crucifixion. And that's what makes the cross so amazing. Before creation, Jesus was at the very top of the organizational chart of the universe. He was God. He was God. But at the end of his life, he wasn't just a servant. Servant. He was a savior dying on a cross. And he never pulled rank. He never asked to be first in line. He never demanded his rights. He never leveraged who he was and the power that he had for the good of others and the glory of God. And friend, that is when you really begin to unwrap uh, not just Christmas gifts, but the gift of Christmas. When you realize that Christmas is not just what Jesus did for us, but what you and I are to do for him. And the way that he lived his life is the way that you and I are commanded to live our life. That's why Paul began this entire passage with verse number uh, like this in verse number four, where he said, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in 
Christ Jesus. Christ spent his entire life doing two things, obeying God and serving others. You ought to spend your entire life from this point forward, if you haven't started already, obeying God and serving others. We're, we're not God, but we can be gracious. We're not heavenly, but we can be humble. We're not sovereigns, but we can be servants. And friend, if you will unwrap the Christmas gift and begin to sing the doxology of Christmas, you'll want to think the way Jesus thought. You'll want to live the way Jesus lived. You ought to be... You ought to be um, thoughtful that he identified with you, but you ought to be thankful that he was crucified for you. Amen. Thirdly and lastly, you ought to be mindful that Jesus is magnified over you. Be mindful that he's magnified over us. It's great that we celebrate a baby in a cradle. We ought to. We ought to be thankful for a Savior who died on a cross. We ought to celebrate that Jesus came back from the dead. Absolutely. But if you're going to fully unwrap the Christmas gift, you cannot leave Jesus in a cradle, you cannot leave him on a cross, and you certainly cannot leave him in a cave. You've got to get him off of one, you've got to get him out of the other, and you've got to put him on a throne. And that is why the Apostle Paul climaxes everything he says about Jesus with these words in verse number 9. <clears throat> Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Now stop there just for a moment. The word wherefore is important in light of the fact that Jesus was willing to go low. In light of the fact that he would go to the very lowest that he possibly could. He's still going to wind up elevated and exalted as the highest. The Bible says God has given Jesus the name which is above every name. Now, Jesus was a common every, everyday name. It was uh, certainly in that day. The name that God has given Jesus is the name Lord. Jesus was his earthly name. Lord is his eternal name. Jesus was his Human name, Lord, is his heavenly name. Jesus, oh, he is our redeemer, but Lord, he is our ruler. Jesus was born as a human so that he could relate to us. He died as a savior so that he could redeem us. He was raised as Lord to rule over us, and that is how the entire world is going to respond to him one of these days. Verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Uh, pause there for a moment. When you bow the knee, you're surrendering. It's a sign of surrender. When you want to honor someone, exalt someone, and, and elevate someone, and lift someone up, you, you bow the knee before them. And, and Paul doesn't mince, mince words. He says, every knee is going to bow. Every knee. Whether by choice, whether by force. It really doesn't matter. Every knee. Every knee above us in heaven whether it be angels or, 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 or humans, every knee around us, whether it's a believer or an unbeliever, every knee under us, whether it's the devil and every demon, they're going to bow and they're going to surrender to the lordship of Jesus Christ. By the way, it's not going to be done silently either. Notice in verse 11, in that every tongue should confess, every mouth is going to open, and confess that Jesus Christ, here it is, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every tongue. Every atheist tongue. Every agnostic tongue. Every angelic tongue. Every demonic tongue. Every human tongue is going to confess four words. Jesus Christ is Lord. And at that point, the round trip of Christmas will have been completed. The baby that was crying in a cradle, who became a man who died on a cross, will be where he's always been in eternity. And will always be in eternity, reigning upon his throne. And the Bible says it's all going to be done to the glory of God 
the Father. Friend, the purpose of this universe, the purpose of all of history, let's hone this in a little bit, the purpose of your life and my life is to bring glory to God. And when you really unwrap this Christmas gift, you're going to understand that Christmas is is not primarily about giving Christmas gifts to each other, and that's certainly appropriate, and I love doing it. But primarily, it's about giving God the glory because of his gift of Christmas that he gave to us. It's really interesting to note that there are no other recorded births in Scripture after the birth of Jesus Christ. The last genealogy listed in the Bible is that of Christ. Why is that? Why is that? Well, all of, all of biblical history recorded before the Gospels was pointing to the birth of this baby, a baby that would be born in a borrowed manger. Everything and everyone always been getting ready for the gift of Christmas. And now he's here. And we look back and we celebrate it. We worship him. I heard a story about a great plastic surgeon named Dr. Maxwell Maltz. And he tells the story, Dr. Maltz tells the story, a, a remarkable story, a true story about a man who had been injured in a fire who was attempting to save his parents from their burning house. Unfortunately, his parents died in the process he wasn't able to save them and at the same time his face was was totally totally permanently burned and disfigured um, where dr malt said when you looked at him you'd never recognize who he was the gentleman thought it was god's punishment on his life and so he decided that he would lock himself up in a room and wouldn't let anyone see him he was so shame embarrassed and shamed by the way he looked he he really even cut his wife off, wouldn't even have anything to do with his wife. So his wife went to Dr. Maltz for help. He explained the situation. Dr. Maltz told her, said, look, I can probably restore his face to where he'll be willing to let other people see him. But she knew that wouldn't help because the husband refused any help and was very stubborn, and so she refused the doctor's offer. She said he won't accept We're wasting our time. He then said, well, why did you come see me if you're not going to accept my offer of help? And she said, well, I came here not because I want you to do any surgery on my husband, but because I want you to do surgery on me. I want you to disfigure my face so that I can look like him. And if I can look like my husband and hurt like my husband, then maybe he'll let me back into his life. Dr. Maltz was shocked, and of course he denied her request. He said, I can't do that. But he was so moved by that woman's love for her, for her husband that he decided that he would pay a personal visit to their home. And so he goes to the home, knocks on the door. The man refused to open it. Dr. Maltz said this. He said, sir, he said, um, I'm Dr. Maxwell Maltz. I'm a, I'm a world-renowned plastic surgeon. I want you to know that I believe I can restore your face. There was no response. A few minutes passed. He spoke. He said, sir, please come. Come out, I would love to talk to you and, and help you. And there was no answer. Still speaking through the door, Dr. Maltz told the man what his wife had done. He said, sir, you don't realize this, but your wife came to my office, my clinic, and she wants me to disfigure her face, to make her face look like your face, because she wants back into your life. That's how much she loves you. Of course, after a brief moment of silence, the door knob began to turn, the man came out. I thought what a telling, what a moving story, what a moving testimony. And the way that that woman loved her husband will tell you just a small fraction of how God loves you. How God loves you. Just make the offer. Because here's what he did when he came to earth. He took on your face, my face. He disfigured himself and became like you and became like me. Lived 33 and a half years on this earth, suffered like you suffer. Was tempted in all points just like you were tempted, yet without sin. Died like us, even worse than us. Died for us so that we could be like him. 
and live with him forever. And that, my friend, is Christmas doxology. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed this morning, I don't know how to close this other than to say that you and I owe him a lot of praise. And we owe him a lot of glory. That baby in a manger would grow up to become the savior of this world, was the savior of this world. Would grow up to die on Calvary's cross. And he would die. Replace him in a Borrowed tomb, he had to borrow that, he didn't own anything. Fortunately, he didn't need to own it because he wouldn't stay very long. Three days later, he would arise from the dead. Short time after, he would ascend back to the right hand of God the Father where he is right now making intercession for you, for you. My question for you is, do you know him as Lord and Savior? Well, I'm not talking about a head knowledge, uh, acknowledging that he was a real historical person. and No, 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 no. That, that head knowledge needs to sink 10 or 12 inches and get into your heart. You need to, by faith, trust in him for the forgiveness of your sins and for the salvation of your soul. Have you done that? Have you done that? Have you repented of your sins? and asked Jesus Christ, God incarnate, to save your soul. If you haven't, I'm telling you the greatest Christmas gift you'll ever receive is Him. It's Him. I hope that you know Him as Lord and Savior. If you don't, today would be a wonderful day for you to say an everlasting yes to Him. Have your sins forgiven, cast as far as the east is from the west. To have your name written in the Lamb's book of life. To have the peace that passes all understanding that one of these days when your time on earth is up, whether it's by death or by rapture, that you'll spend eternity in the presence of God. Father, I bow in your presence this morning. Lord, so thankful for, for this time of year where our hearts are inevitably drawn to the greatest gift that you ever gave this world, your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that if there's one under the sound of my voice today that does not know you as Savior, as personal Lord, Lord, that they would, or that they would get that right today, that they would accept you, say yes to you. Lord, we realize that one of these days every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. And so, Father, I pray that we do it here. That one that's closest to hell today, Father, convict them of their sin. Make them uncomfortable in their seat even now. Draw them to you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. What number